the thought of uh, opening up with the Giants uh, makes it special. Uh, especially tonight, one of my closest pals will be coaching third for the Giants, Joe Amalfitano. Joe is uh, 82, and so I'm really not happy that he's going to be coaching third, but uh, that's what they're going to do. So when the game starts, and I I always feel a little something extra. I grew up in New York. Uh, I really grew up in the polo grounds, uh, in the bleachers when I was about 10. I remember that. Uh, my all-time idol was Mel Ott, left-hand hitting right fielder, hit 512 home runs from Gretna, Louisiana. I mean, he was just the end. And he lifted his right leg high in the air whenever he hit. And so naturally, Every time I tried to hit in high school and college, I would raise that right leg up, but something happened between the motion of the bat from here to here. But the leg part, I had it perfectly. So the Giants have, uh, have just always been a part of me. And growing up as a kid, idolizing Adi, I was a rabid Giants fan. And I've enjoyed the meeting something special but tonight is going to be a lot of fun, although I will be praying that Joey is not involved with the line drive. Uh, yeah, he'll be at third base. So that is the, uh, that's the cherry on top to see Joey tonight uh, at third base. Well, Vin, how you doing? You've yeah, seen, Bill. Have you seen uh, Kobe's farewell tour this year? Are you envisioning a farewell tour like Kobe Oh, Ryan? no. No, I'm just an announcer. I belong in the press box, but only really at Dodger Stadium. I, no, no, no. I appreciate Kobe. He's brilliant. And uh, I think it's great that he makes those trips so that uh, everyone can see him one last time. Well, I guess and all those things. A last, a final season full of plaudits and thank yous and all that. You, no. you know, you, you see all what's going on with him. Isn't Bill, it? believe me when I tell you this from the bottom of my heart. I mean, I'm the luckiest person in the whole world. God has been so good to me, it's mind-boggling. But, uh, and to allow me to go this far is fine. But it's not really me. So I'm not gonna take me and bring me on a tour like I'm some Stradivarius or whatever, <laughs> you know. No, no, no tour. Uh, I am because I love the thrill of San Diego opening day. Uh, I could go to opening day in any ballpark in America and just love it. So I'm going to go to San Diego and then go home and open up at Dodger Stadium. And uh, I'll go to Anaheim during the regular year. And the Giants are there for me for the last three games of the season. So it's kind of full circle to start today with the Giants and uh, perhaps wind up in San Francisco. That, that would be kind of nice for me. But you're not really set on how you're going to finish it. You're not set no, on I'm not sure. You know, yeah. Uh, it depends on how well the team plays, but even if they're way out of it, if they're going to finish in San Francisco, I think I'd probably go there anyway. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Have you given much thought to the fact that this is your final season, and what, if anything, you want to make sure you get out of, out of the final one? No, I haven't given it much thought except my usual eagerness to get the season started. Uh, maybe I tried to compare it to feelings in the past, and it might have been the way I felt for the second year of my career. I had one under my belt, and I was so excited to start another one. And this one is special to me, so I'm excited to get it started. I'm not sure how I'll feel when I get down to the end. Uh, being somewhat of a sentimental Irishman, it might be a fight that I have with myself, but uh, I'm looking forward to the whole year without thinking about the end of the year at all. I'm concentrating on today and you know, as it goes. Yeah. Ben, will you uh, talk about uh, the passing of your dear friend Joe Garagio? <sighs> you know, in my lifetime, for whatever reason, I have met more comedians <laughs> than I think anyone in the world. I really, everywhere I turn, I, I've met a comedian. And I remember when I was uh, in college, we had a, a very old professor, although come to think of it, he's younger then than I am now. But in those days, he was an older professor. And two guys laughed in the back of the room. And so the professor stopped and said, would you mind sharing the joke? Well, the guys tried to, and it wasn't funny at all, really. you know. And then the old professor, who was a priest, 
And he said, let me tell you something. It's relatively easy to make people angry. It's relatively easy to make people sad. It is very difficult to make people laugh. And I thought of that all my life. And because I've been privileged to know so many comedians, uh, I think, what a, what a blessing that is for them to spend their lifetime trying to make people laugh. Joe Garagiola was a fellow who made people laugh. He was also a good ball player. And the thing that amazed me when we went to broadcast together, I assumed, bad assumption, but I assumed he spent eight, nine years playing in the big leagues. Uh, he'll come in the booth and tell me some stories, you know, about the experiences, and that'll be that. Oh, no. Here is smiling Joe, good ball player, etc. He was so well prepared for the game, it, it absolutely knocked the wind out of me. I mean, he did not come in, Joe Garagiola, former Cardinal, former Giant, former Pittsburgh, former whatever. No, he came in as a well-prepared sports announcer. And I, I was really impressed with that. He was not trying to tell you uh, when I played and did this. He was analyzing. Uh, he was remarkable. He really was. So, uh, considering the fact that he's been blessed with the ability to make people laugh, and we've been blessed uh, having him make us laugh, uh, I realize the loss that we have is great. Uh, not just making people laugh, but in baseball, the game itself. He was a very religious man. You'll never hear that. But as someone who sat alongside of him, he was deeply religious. He had a marvelous love affair with Audrey. They were living, uh, assisted living in St. Louis, in uh, Arizona. And I think now about Audrey, uh, it's gonna be tough, especially tough. Now, young Joe is still there, and so the thread will continue with baseball. But it was a huge loss uh, to lose Joe. And what's your, what's your feeling on the Time Warner cable issue and the fans are using, are talking about wanting not to miss your last season? Oh, well, I don't think of the last season. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a baseball fan at heart. I really am. Uh, so my first thought is I really want the fans to uh, see all the games. That's the main thing. I don't know anything else about it. Uh, in your paper, they listed the various uh, prices in various cities. And uh, when I compared what I understand they're asking, I thought, well, that looks like a reasonable offer. But that's all I know, in all honesty, yeah. Are you comfortable being the center of the kind of the Oh, thing? no. No, I, I, I realize uh, I just happen to be in the position I'm in. But uh, it's embarrassing because I don't think of myself as that important to the production. I mean, I, I'm just the guy broadcasting. So uh, I just hope it comes for everybody to make them happy. You know, that, that's really all. In all honesty, do you have any special moments with Joe that you could share with us? Uh, probably the most memorable moment. We were not in a ball field. Uh, we went to Shea Stadium. That dates it a little. Went to Shea Stadium in New York, and we got there about 11 o'clock in the morning for the game of the week, and it was pouring. I mean, it was raining like you were in the tropics. Pouring. They called the game early. I know it was before noon, they called the game. So the network always have a car and driver for you to take you to the airport. And we got in the car, Joe and I in the back seat. We leave Shea Stadium to go to um, Kennedy. And we can't get there. The underpasses are full of water. We don't know that till we get there, nor do hundreds and hundreds of other cars. Speed up the story. We spent eight hours sitting in the car trying to get out of New York. And we wound up, believe it or not, at LaGuardia. We got out and there was a red jacket man saying, where are you going? And Joe said, anywhere. <laughs> and the fellow was startled. And then we said, just, we just got to get out of here. So we got tickets to St. Louis. And then from St. Louis, Joe flew to Phoenix, I flew to LA. But to spend eight hours sitting in the back of a car, not going anywhere, 
uh, and still having some laughter was typical, I think, of our association. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So there are a lot of Phoenix fans that, as children grew up listening to you teach them baseball. Were you aware of that influence as you? You mean of Phoenix? In Phoenix, uh, out of market Dodger games. Yeah. Uh, the Dodger radio network in other cities. Did you realize you were reaching out? Uh, places well, you didn't have baseball uh, around? yeah. I when I did football, in the NFL. Every Saturday, you'd have a production meeting for the Sunday game. And on Saturday, the producers would say, uh, tomorrow's game is going to be seen by 65% of the country, or 90%, or four. And I used to say to the producer, please, please, don't tell me the percentage. I don't give the percentage of the audience. I'm going to do the best I can, whether it's 1% or 100%. So that's always been my philosophy. Uh, even in our current situation, uh, I'm not going to walk into the booth and say, well, we're not on television in X percent. I can't do that. So I've got to go on no matter what I'm on. All I'm thinking of, this is 100%. And I think that's the only way to really do the job. Yeah. I mean, do you think you'll cherish moments anymore knowing this is your last time when you get to the ballpark? Are there certain moments at the ballpark you think you'll cherish more this year? Is it you know, one of the things I worry about really is, uh, that's my phone, uh, we won't answer. <laughs> uh, go away, please. Uh, no, you know, uh, the, the thing that bothers me really and truly uh, is making it sound like, how do you put it, that because it's my last year, I'm almost more important than the game. I, I, that scares me to death. That's the last thought. I just want to do the game. I just want to have fun and eventually you know, say, OK, Scully, that's enough. See ya. Uh, that's OK. So I, I can't think that way at all. Otherwise, I'm going in thinking, what else can I do today to make it more of my game? And oh, gosh, you know, no, no, no. Whoever it is, uh, I just want to see him play and play well. Major League Baseball asked you to be a part of the All-Star Game in San Diego, whether it's calling an inning in any other capacity. Is that something you'd have interest in? No, none whatsoever. Uh, there have been a lot of the networks who've been very nice asking me to do an inning or two, or what, and I don't belong there. You know, When I did Game of the Week, um, we had worked every week together, and you did it. Uh, now I don't do it. And if they say, and Fox, for instance, uh, They've been great all the time. Come on in, do the game. I mean, uh, Joe, uh, Jack's son Joe said, do the whole game, you know. And I said, no, 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 I don't belong there. I belong uh, in Dodger Stadium, in the booth, and uh, that's where I belong, that's where I've lived, and uh, that's where I will stay until it's over. But no, no, quote, guest appearances, no way. I mean, the, the Dodgers make the playoffs, we go beyond the postseason, would you do them for the postseason? I, you know, we'll have to talk about that. Uh, it'll be hard not to, uh, so perhaps I will. I don't know by that time, you know. Last year I missed, uh, I had a little uh, work done, and so I missed the playoffs. But instead of, uh, and I was lucky, I really didn't need help to think that way. Uh, instead of saying, I missed, I'm missing the playoffs with the Mets, my mind kept telling me, do you realize how lucky you are that all the World Series and the playoffs and the All-Star Games, and you never missed one? And so instead of, of feeling sad, I was eternally grateful for all those opportunities. I guess it's just the way you look at things, really. How's your health now? Good, thank God, yeah. No, no complaints whatsoever. Um, nope. I'll take my Mel Allen swing and go up in the booth and imagine I'm still playing. Yeah, I feel great. Yeah. They will they're probably, I'm guessing, in every, every home game this year, they will, because people who come out, it may be the last time they come to a Dodger game, they're going to want to look at, love at you and honor you. Are you going to be okay with that? I'm, I'm certain, I don't know if this can happen, but I'm guessing it will. Well, I hope not. I mean, really, I, I, I hope that people come to see the Dodgers play. Uh, they listen to me if they don't come. And uh, But no, I, I would. I love this game, and I don't want to get somehow out in front of it just because it's my last year. No, I would be very happy to have people come out and love every minute of a very exciting game, period. That, that's, that's the best for me, yeah, without a doubt. 
you yes, sir. Picturing the, the clearance rate of, as you're, if you were picturing the millions you're broadcasting to, who are you picturing? Who are you talking to? I guess, really, as I got older and uh, I calmed down, when you first start, you know, my gosh, everything has to be right. You're afraid. You're jump up, up, up. And then later you eventually relax. And I guess if I had to be talking to somebody, it would be somebody sitting next to me in the ballpark. Not, not uh, section eight of, uh, of the ballpark, just some person. And I, because, you know, even when you're sitting in the ballpark, you're not watching every second of every play. When there's the end of a play, you sit back. Uh, maybe you're admiring something, uh, a child in the ballpark or whatever. Uh, that's the way I try to broadcast, is if I'm just sitting next to somebody and we're watching the game together, you know. Mr. Scully, in your long career, yes. you're, I believe you, you have many foreign players you, you have broadcast. Oh, and sure. This year, there's Maeda. I, I haven't met him yet. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'll lay that line on him. Skoshi Nihongo Hanase Masu, ne? Which means in Japanese, I speak a very little Japanese. Uh, the, the first Japanese, 1956, uh, Dodgers went to Japan. And I got a little teeny booklet, and it was phonetics. English, Japanese, Japanese, English. And uh, the first thing I learned was uh, Scotch Mizu Taksan Kori, Dozo. And what that means is scotch and water and a lot of ice. <laughs> that, that, that was my beginning of my Japanese. But uh, yeah, I'm looking for it. I'll, uh, I'll say to him, uh, Ohio gozaimashita, uh, which means good morning. That's the easiest to learn. If you want to say good morning to someone in Japan, Ohio. Ohio. That's it, Ohio. Yeah. <laughs> and I can go through the rest of it. Anyway, I haven't met him, but I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Taking one more stab at your legacy in Arizona. You may have noticed there's a lot of Dodger fans who live in Arizona. Oh, sure. Probably, probably generationally grew up, are Dodger fans because they grew up listening to those broadcasts? Uh, I, I don't know, to and be honest. Those people who credit you for setting the foundation Oh, Arizona having a baseball team. You know, I get credit for one thing, really, that I've lasted this long. And that hasn't been anything that I had to do with. Uh, if I get a Lifetime Achievement Award, let's say, uh, I think of it as, well, first of all, Lifetime, I don't have control of my lifetime. I'm not trying to belabor the point, but God's in control of my life. So Lifetime, nothing that I did. And the second word is achievement. But if I look at the word achievement, I think when I die, they will write my obit and they will say, uh, he broadcast 25 no-hitters, three perfect games, 85,000 all-star games, etc." But I didn't achieve it. I, I was there and I was privileged to witness all of that. And that's really the way I look at this entire sequence of my life. Uh, in a sense, it's out of my hands. And as far as fans saying what you just said, I hope that's nice, but only because I was given the opportunity uh, to be there. You know, that means a, a great, great deal to me, more than anything. Yeah. And you had the, your, your ringtone was an old-fashioned ring. Is that was that your this idea? ring? No, the ringtone on your on your phone that just rang. Oh, that's old fashioned. Did you put that in there? Yeah, I did. I, I don't know why. I just put it in there. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to put me and say hi. I'm not here now, but you know. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, it sounds nice, although it shouldn't have been ringing. You know, <laughs> it's not, it's I can't not. control. Yeah. Well, it's a big crowd. I'm sorry I didn't give you anything. You know. Uh, Is there was there any place you you uh, anything? If you thought about what, what you'll miss, what you'll miss most? I'll miss the fans, the, the sounds of the fans. Um, when I, I've told this before, when I was about eight and the nuns asked you what you wanted to be, and I said I wanted to be a sports announcer, back then that was really rare. The only thing that I can think of on radio, there was no TV, was uh, college football games on Saturday. And I used to crawl under the radio with a pillow, a glass of milk, and some saltine crackers. And this big radio had a cross piece. I put the pillow on that, and I'd crawl underneath. 
and the speaker would be directly over my head. And I don't know who it was. It's Tennessee, Alabama. I'm a kid, you know, in a fifth floor walk up apartment, knowing no one in Tennessee or Alabama. But someone would score and the crowd would go crazy. And that crowd noise would come down and wash over me, really like water out of a shower head. I used to get ecstatic just over the roar. Later, I think I wish I was there. Later, I thought I'd like to be calling the game. To this day, if there is a very good play in the ballpark and the crowd lets out a roar, I shut up. And during that time that I shut up, I'm eight years old underneath the radio. So when it's over, that's probably the first thing I will miss. I'm not going to crawl under the television set. You know? And uh, yeah, so I think number one will be the roar of the crowd, the goosebumps that you get. Uh, yeah, that'll be number one. You still get goosebumps, didn't you? Yeah, that's always been my uh, thermometer as far as my baseball fever is concerned. Uh, I still get them, so uh, I'm sure I'm going to get them throughout the year. Yeah. If there's a good play and the crowd goes bananas, I guess I hold the record. Uh, I shut up when Henry Aaron hit his home run. Probably the longest uh, shut up uh, in baseball history. And then I think I matched it when Kirk Gibson hit his home run. I mean, I just loved it. Not that it meant the game, the score, nothing. It was the roar of the crowd. So that's, I think, uh, I never even thought about it that much until now. That's what I'm going to miss. Is that your favorite call, improbable, impossible? Is that your? Uh, I don't know. I don't have a favorite, favorite. really. Uh, I'll tell you the truth. The first time I heard it play back, I thought, where did that come from? I mean, I had no idea. You don't write down something and hope that you can duck it in. I don't know where it came from. It, it, it just came out. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. And the Henry Aaron one, I shut up for so long that it gave me a chance to think. So that when I did get back on, I talked about how important it was a black man being honored in the Deep South for breaking an icon's record, uh, that kind of stuff. But at least I had the minute and a half to just sit there thinking, wow, do you realize? But the Gibby one was like a bolt of electricity, you know. Oh my gosh, yeah, yeah. That's my greatest contribution in all my years with the Dodgers. And it was getting Gibby off the training table uh, at the end of the game. Yeah, because he, he was sitting with ice on both legs and he's watching the television screen. And uh, I had said to the producer, I had no thoughts of anything else but this. I said, if you were uh, here in the ballpark with us, and I had asked the producer, follow me. I said, if you were here with us tonight, and they had the blimp, I said, the first thing you do now you'd look to the Dodger dugout. Wham! Up comes the dugout. And I said, you would look. And the camera panned the whole dugout. And I said, Gibby's not there. Obviously, he's not going to play tonight. Well, whatever happened, sitting in the quiet of the trainer's room, looking at television, it suddenly struck a note. And Gibby got up and hollered, tell Tommy I'll be there. Next thing you know, he comes down at magic. So I told him. I said, the, the greatest contribution I've made to the game of baseball was getting you off the trainer's table that night. Uh, going back to when you were an eight-year-old little boy, who was your favorite baseball player growing up? Oh, Mel Ott. Mel Ott of the New York Giants and Carl Hubble. Uh, you have to remember, the, the Polo Grounds was a very big ballpark. Uh, it was, I think, 461 feet to center. Most of them today are like 399. So I was in a bleacher 460 feet plus uh, watching the games. And he, of course, was the home run hitter. And so he was the man. And then uh, Carl Hubble, the pitcher. Not that he was knocked out very often, but Hubble's uniform looked like it hang drab on him. He was skinny, round shouldered, pants were down where the players use them today, down by the ankles. In those days, you saw everybody stocking. And uh, when he was knocked out of a game, he didn't go in the dugout. He'd have to go to the clubhouse. And the clubhouse was 465, 400. So his walk from the mound 
round-shouldered, walking back. It used to break my heart, but if you look at the record, uh, he didn't make that walk too many times. But at eight years old, it struck me. I felt like crying. The reason I became a Giant fan, it was uh, 1960, uh, 1936 World Series, uh, the Yankees and the Giants. And my grammar school was 20 blocks from where I lived. And in between that walk was a Chinese laundry. And every day I'd make that walk. And during the World Series, the owner of the laundry kept a line score on the window. And I was walking home. I forget which game. You could look it up if it's that interesting. And I looked at the line score. And the Yankees had beaten the Giants. I think it was. 18 to 3 or 18 to 6. I know it was 18 for sure. And I didn't know either team, but my first thought was, oh, those poor giants. Oh my God, was he 18 to. And that was the moment that I became a giant fan. So had the Yankees been losing, I might have been a Yankee <laughs> fan. I don't know. But I was a rabid Giants fan because they were getting their fannies kicked anyway.